Welcome to Zero Knowledge. I'm your host, Anna Rose. In this podcast, we will be exploring the latest in zero knowledge research and the decentralized web, as well as new paradigms that promise to change the way we interact and transact online. This week, Nico and I chat with Ron Rothblum, professor in computer science at Technion. Ron is someone who's been working for a very long time on the theory of cryptography and ZK topics. And in this conversation, we chat about his work on error correcting codes, Reed Solomon encoding, Fry, FFTs, Fiat Shamir, and more. This was a pretty cryptography heavy episode, even for this show, but I hope you enjoy. Before we start in, I just want to let you know that the application to attend ZK Summit 10 is now open. The event will be happening in London on September 20th. And as always, we aim to bring together the top researchers, engineers, and practitioners working on ZK to share their latest research and new findings. So if you're interested in attending, be sure to apply. That is the only way you get access to tickets. So I've added the link in the show notes and hope to see you there. Now, Tanya will share a little bit about this week's sponsor. Alio is a new layer one blockchain that achieves the programmability of Ethereum, the privacy of Zcash, and the scalability of a rollup. If you're interested in building private applications, then check out Alio's programming language called Leo. Leo enables non-cryptographers to harness the power of ZKPs to deploy decentralized exchanges, hidden information games, regulated stablecoins, and more. Visit developer.alio.org to learn more. For questions, join their Discord at alio.org forward slash Discord. So thanks again, Alio. And now here's our episode. So today we're here with Ron Rothblum, a professor at Technion and someone who's been working on the theory of cryptography and ZK topics for the last 15 years. Welcome to the show, Ron. Thank you for having me. And we also have Nico here to help co-host this one. Hey, Nico. Hi, Anna. Hi, Ron. Hey. So this interview came about because I was having a conversation with Dave Oja talking about potential guests, and he he thought it would be really great to have you on, Ron. And his reasons were kind of like, you do all these interviews about present day snark work, but you might be missing some of the earlier stuff. And so he thought it would be cool to have you on also potentially to talk a little bit more about information theory. And then he also thought maybe error correction codes. So I know we have a lot to cover and we're very excited to hear more about you. Maybe we can get to some of those as we go. So Ron, why don't you tell us just a little bit about yourself? What was it that got you excited about this field? And yeah, how did you get to the place that you are today? Um, okay, so a tiny bit of, of background. So it's back about 15 years ago. I had been working um, in a company doing some uh, crypto engineering. I actually worked with Kobe uh, there for, for a short time. So I know, I know Kobe Gherkin? There. Yeah. Wow, um, nice. So we know each other from a long, a long time back. Um, and I didn't like, it was like really low level crypto engineering. I didn't love it. And I went off to do a master's and I thought I would do some sort of a theory, mathy kind of thing, thinking about algorithms or something. I really didn't think I would do crypto because I did not la- love the crypto that I was doing before. Um, but I went uh, anyway and I did a, a master's at the Weizmann Institute. And I took this course on uh, foundations of cryptography, which was given by Odette Goldreich, who is one of the sort of... Uh, I would say main leaders of the foundations of, of cryptography in general and specifically zero knowledge. He's one of the inventors of, you know, the, the famous three coloring protocol. It's the first feasib- like general feasibility result for, for zero knowledge. And that gave, gave the, the course. It was, is, you know, outstanding. I really, really loved it. Mm. It actually shows the protocol using, you know, physical transparencies. It's, it's uh, really something, uh, a sight to be seen. What, what do you mean physical transparent? What does that mean? Think about the 80s. Um, I don't know if uh, people were alive then, but um, where <laughs> you had like uh, a projector yeah. and you had like uh, transparency yeah. that you would put and project. Uh-huh. So it, when it's really perfectly suited for the three coloring protocol. So you draw the graph without colors on it, and then you put the colors on top and you put another piece of paper hiding the colors. Okay. So it actually just like runs the protocol to, to show oh. it. Oh, neat. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really nice. Anyway, it was, uh, it was uh, fantastic. And I started working with him, ended up doing also my PhD with him. I did a postdoc at MIT and, and came back to the Technion. So what drew me to the field is, A, an amazing course given by Oded. Yeah. And 
I, to be honest, I just really love the math underlying it. Uh, it's challenging. It's interesting. It covers a lot of different fields, in particular, error correcting code that maybe we can talk about. Um, mm. So it's been a blast so far. Is it also because like the fact that it's very, very cutting edge, or I guess a lot of research is very, very cutting edge. Would it be the fact that it's getting used or applied? Uh, I think research by definition is sort of cutting edge. Um, yeah. No, it is not at all about it being applied, to be honest. I mean, okay. when, I, when I started working on this, you know, 10, 15 years ago, it was no one thought, I think, maybe except for Eddie Benson and a few others, if you look back like <laughs> 2008, 2009, people did not think that any of this would be possible. You know, FHE, wow. the, the first like idea, basic idea of an FHE scheme was coming out and it looked like, you know, it, it became from like uh, something totally, you know, we had no idea how to do it. It just became went down to science fiction, but still science fiction, you know, someone yeah. had any, like a feasibility uh, idea. Oh. So that, that was not what drew me. It is something that nowadays that it's happening, I find it really exciting. And it's sort of what I like to do is for it to motivate my still like theory research. So mm. the fact that it's being used raises some fundamental questions. And if I can frame these questions as something neat, as a clean the theory question for which we don't know a solution, that is the kind of thing that I really like to to work on. I'm sort of curious, like how much of the actual implementation and engineering, or like almost like the research that comes out of that, does that filter back into what you're doing, or would you say the theory side is just its own track and it and it just kind of plows on, doesn't need to kind of get that input? Because I know like research on the industrial, like the industry research and the implementation, there's a big back and forth there, but I don't know about just pure theory. Uh, definitely. I mean, especially, so I'm getting sort of inspired from my questions, questions that I'm working on uh, from practice. And I see like things that practitioners or you know, from my end, the uh, sort of engineering research that's going on and improvements yeah. that, that are happening. And uh, it can be kind of concrete. I've had some works on uh, linear time proving that have come out of that. And it was sort of understanding what currently can be done. And can I frame a clean theory question for which uh, we don't know an answer and then try to work on that. So definitely it's been, uh, from my perspective, back and forth. Which protocol or project, like who was using that, that kind of gave you that feedback loop? I wonder if it's anyone we know. Um, so, 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 I mean, hard to trace exactly back, but I mean, I was certainly aware of, so, so Justin Taylor and, and his co-authors had this like CMT protocol, which is an improvement of GKR. Uh, the R there is another Rothblum, which happens to be my brother guy. Oh. Um, <laughs> so, so definitely was, uh, on my mind. And, and I understood that it, that it's uh, something that people in practice are really interested in. And maybe this is jumping ahead, thinking about sort of error correcting codes. What are the bottlenecks? Why people are, are sort of only using specific types of error correcting codes nowadays um, made me start to think of, you know, how do I bypass these barriers? Mm. You just mentioned your brother, who's also a cryptographer. Yeah. Who got into it first? He did. He did. Okay. Uh, it was. He actually gave me motivation to sort of not join the field, so we won't be like uh, <laughs> stepping on each other's toes. It, it kept you away more than anything. It kept me anything. away a little bit, but then you know, Odid was just too charismatic. So nice. Yeah. So you said you started with uh, an experience in practice, and you disliked sort of the very low level practice, and then you went into theory. Yeah. And now, what's happening in the Industry research, like more practical world, is feeding back into theory a bit. Do you do you feel dragged to practice ever, or you you really have a dislike for it and stay away? I mean, dislike is too strong of a word. It was okay. just like not my forte. Uh, okay, fair. Um, and and it was, it's also like was very different from like relevant things that are happening now. So I certainly find the fact that these things are becoming practical super exciting. And if some of the ideas that I have end up, you know, through some papers, uh, and I think this happened mm -hmm. going into practical work, that, that that's fantastic. Cool. So a few episodes ago, maybe a little over a month now, um, Ariel Gabizon and I went through this sort of trilogy of snarks that he had in mind. And I know we spoke just before this episode, you mentioned you had heard it. That was one of the episodes I was hoping you'd listen to because 
I really wondered what someone from your perspective, who's been working on it from where you have been working on it for so long, how you would interpret that. If you agreed, if you see things sort of differently, or if you're kind of like focus, like if you look at big breakthroughs, are you looking kind of at a different level of the stack? So it's an interesting question. Um, I think from, from a theory perspective, if you look at the basic question of uh, things like succinct arguments, uh, snarks, and so on, from a theory perspective, you could say this problem was solved in 92. Okay, so people developed this. <laughs> 1992. Extreme, 1992. <laughs> okay. So, so people developed this extremely strong tool called a PCP, publicly checkable proof. Um, they knew how to do Merkle trees on top of it. You do that, put on Fiat Shamir. Fiat Shamir is from 86. Um, and you have yourself a snark. Um, and that, that was all well known in um, 19, 1992. And it was also considered something that has no chance of ever being feasible. Mm. What, what I think happened and this development of the trilogy and so on is I think people sort of found ways to get improvements on speed by sort of shifting to, to different ideas. This idea of linear PCPs, um, IKO and, uh, um, you know, growth and so on, b- building on, on top of that. And these gradual improvements can c- have more hope and more interest. And from somehow from my perspective, the ideas that this eventually led to nowadays are really going back to some of the ideas from the early 90s. So some some check based things. Mm-hmm. Um, but you have to go through all of these steps in between, sort of give you enough hope that this thing is indeed uh, doable. Going back to that time, though, could you have just combined them and it would have worked fine? Or were there some other breakthroughs that needed to happen for these to be like reincorporated into the proving systems? So it depends on your, on your definition of the word fine. Um, there is the theory definition and there is the practice definition. Okay. Um, the theory They're definition fine says, in theory. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the, the basic theory definition says the prover runs in polynomial time. Um, but the practice definition says that, you know, cubic time is a no-no. Mm-hmm. Um, but this sort of, from my perspective, it, uh, so, so when I said that it was solved problem in the early 90s, I meant that it was in fine in this like very uh, broad theory perspective. But now that there's an understanding that there's a bottleneck of prover time in practice, this raises a theory question. You know, can you get the same result that we had in the 90s, but with a quasi-linear time prover, a linear time prover? So mm. th- that that is something that I've, I've been working on and I'm really interested in. So when you're making this distinction between like the, the theory and the practice, does theory consider things like pairing-based cryptography, or does that fall already too much in the realm of practice? No, absolutely. Absolutely it okay. does. And I think uh, a lot of these papers, some fall, they're they right on the edge of theory and, and practice, a lot of these papers, and, and a lot of the people doing them, especially if you look at some like uh, Alec Kiesa's papers, mm-hmm. he often has a theory paper followed a little bit later by a practice paper that builds on the theoretical idea. Um, he's someone who really is very good at like sort of thinking of a conceptual idea and articulating it as a theory advancement, but then also mm-hmm. trying to make, build that into a system. Interesting. Yeah. The reason I was bringing up pairings is because, so Ariel's trilogy is very much based around pairings and mm-hmm. sort of oh, how yeah, they've he, made he their way. that. That was the pairing-based yeah. snark trilogy. Yes. Yeah. And I think here we have a chance of talking about everything else that's sort of been excluded from the pairing land like stark stuff like starks and the work of ben sasson is sort of almost you know hidden away in ariel's trilogy Mm -hmm. and i think that's maybe closer to the stuff you've been working on absolutely and and, and i mean i I think you know when when eddie ben sasson when he introduces himself or at least the way he used to it was as a complexity theorist not as a cryptographer because that's what he did for you know like you know that's what his phd is about and what what he did as a researcher until he he did this big shift and a lot of uh, things like the basic, you know, fry and stuff that Starkware is doing is based on um, sort of deep theory and deep theoretical advancements that happened in, in you know, in the realm of PCPs. Mm. Should we take a bit of time for, I guess, definitions or making sure that we know what we mean when we're saying complexity theory, information theory, that kind of thing? Sure. So uh, complexity theory is a sort of broad field that is trying to understand computation. So what tests can be computed and at what cost, um, and what tasks cannot be computed. And you can vary the type of resources that are available, whether it be uh, time, space, uh, depth, if you're t- talking about circuits. And a lot of uh, the field actually 
has developed around proof systems. Mm. So if you think of you know, the, the most basic question, I think in, in computer science, arguably also in math, is the P versus MP question. This is clearly a question about the existence of, of uh, or what can proof systems do and what they cannot do. And the advancement of the, our understanding or suggestions for the notion of a proof have, th these have led to notions like interactive proofs, PCPs, and zero knowledge, which nowadays are having a big impact in practice. But they've had an enormous impact throughout the years on this entire field of computational complexity theory, um, generating entire subfields within. Um, so I, I don't know if people are aware of this, but this, um, this tool called PCPs, it was introduced in the early 90s. For about 20 years, almost all of the research that went into it was about its relation to a totally different field in complexity theory called hardness of approximation. Hardness of approximation? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So this, this is a field that deals with showing that some problems are hard not just to solve, but even to approximate. So this is kind okay. of using this sort of machinery that we think of as very positive PCPs. It's a useful tool. It was being used to show lower bounds, to show that some tasks are hard. So, so anyway, that was uh, tr me trying uh, to articulate this field of complexity theory. Can and, I ask? Can I ask one thing before you move on? Yeah. Uh, people use the term PCPs. I've totally had this defined for me, but what does it stand for? Okay, so it is uh, probabilistically checkable proof. Okay, and um, this and this is what you mean by probabilistic. So you're trying to approximate the hardness. No, no, no. no. no it's okay. coming, oh, no, coming, not coming that. From, okay, coming from somewhere else. Let, let me actually okay, say okay. Uh, maybe remind the definition <laughs> of, of a PCP and. Um, I think maybe in retrospect, it would have been a better name for this object would have been a locally checkable proof. So the idea is um, you have a proof that you want to check. It's written down, but you're only allowed to read a very small number of bits from this proof. And based on this small number of proofs, you should be convinced is the statement that you care about true or false. It sounds paradoxical, like how can you get any information from reading a small number of bits? But miraculously, we can build this kind of thing. Hmm. And IOPs or interactive oracle proofs are a generalization of this notion in which it's not just like one static proof from which you read a small number of bits, but it's sort of this interactive thing where you send a proof, read a few bits, uh, send another proof, read a few bits, and so on. So going back to the why is it, so the reason, what is it, the hardness of, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on what you just said. Hardness of approximation. It's nothing to do with the word probability. And uh, Oh, so it, it is, it is, it is. Oh, it is. But, uh, oh, it um, is. Yes, def definitely. But uh, so first of all, the, the why is the word probabilistically there? Because the places that you choose to read from the proof are chosen at random. Okay, so there's some process that, that chooses these points. Um, and, and maybe to uh, remind the readers, why are we talking about PCPs in this context? So there's a way to take a PCP, which is this long proof, and turn it into a succinct argument. Basically, you can do something like a Merkle tree um, for the entire proof, and then you want to read the points the, 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 the few relevant points, you can open up the Merkle paths. And uh, this basic idea is underlying all IOPs that, that uh, are around. Why is this related to hardness of approximation? It's, it's a little bit technical, but, but the, the point is that you're saying the fact that this PCP exists means that there's a reduction mapping any problem to a problem in which there is sort of this gap. Mm -hmm. If you start off with something that is true, you get this proof that Kind of no matter where you check, you'll see truth. Whereas if you started with something that is false, you get some something in which in most places you see something it's that false. is false. Ooh, uh, okay. But in most places, so you've, you've sort of generated this kind of gap. And if you could solve this gap problem, you could solve the original problem. As long as you believe that the original problem is hard, it means that even solving this gap problem is going to be hard. Okay. And that is the connection to hardness of approximation, which is a huge field inside of complexity theory. And not related to cryptography? R related in this indirect way. Okay, in the fact that the same technique mm -hmm. could be used for that, and that's yes. maybe where the boom of the 90s came from. Was it the yes. 90s? 80s, yes. 90s. And mm. uh, interesting. So it's very much borrowing from another field. Yes, and, and, and I mean, there have been amazing developments, amazing ideas in that field, which I think could very well end up being used also in the context of our sort of use of PCPs. Cool. So there's a lot more to bring from that field that yes. we haven't been using yet. Oh, that's yes. very interesting. That's very promising. Yeah. 
Let's move on to another point, Nico, you just mentioned, which was information theory. So I know those two words and (laughs) I feel like people have mentioned this on the show before. It's the mathematical theory of communication. I don't know if yeah. that, that's where I, yep. what I found on the internet. I'm not actually clear on what that is. So you, you defined it beautifully, I think. Um, so mathematical you, theory, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> mathematical theory of, of communication is great. It's a big field. There's a lot going on there, very uh, deep and beautiful math. I think the most relevant part to uh, proof systems is uh, error correcting codes, which is sort of a subfield within information theory. And that, again, like underlies essentially all the sort of underlying interactive Oracle proofs, PCPs, and non-cryptographic components that go into building uh, stuff like SNARKs. So this is where, would you say that's the primary, within the information theory field is the error correction or error correcting error correcting correction codes? codes. Yeah. Is that the primary link then to cryptography and ZK, or is there a lot of other, I, I sort of picture information theory as this big umbrella term. Like, are there other right. things that we're already using in SNARKs that would fall under that? Yeah, I mean, there are definitely, so information theory gives a lot of tools. So I'm sure people are using things like uh, notions of entropy and so on to argue about proof systems. But as a sort of a big hammer that's being used, I would say that error correcting codes are the number one thing. Okay. So I think this is a really good moment to introduce error correcting codes. Uh, Tell us what this is. Okay, so uh, error correcting codes are uh, this really basic object in in computer science. The idea is the following. So suppose that Alice wants to transmit a message uh, to Bob, but she wants to do it over this noisy communication channel. Okay, so just then, if you just send a message in the clear, some of the bits uh, could disappear, could flip, um, and you're unhappy. So what you would like to do is to first encode the message in such a way that even if this encoded message gets partially corrupt, Bob can still recover the message. And this basic idea sort of comes from uh, Shannon's amazing work in, in the late 40s introducing this, this problem. And it's been extremely well studied since then. So we have uh, a fantastic understanding of, of error correcting codes. Um, may, maybe just to give uh, an example so people have in mind, so that maybe probably the most famous example of an error correcting code is what's known as the Reed-Solomon code, in which code words are basically just low degree univariate polynomials. And because polynomials don't like each other so much that you don't like to agree on a lot of points, if you take your message, you encode it inside a polynomial, if Alice does this and sends over this polynomial to Bob, even if a few of the coordinates are flipped, let's say, uh, we know mechanisms for recovering the underlying polynomial and the underlying message. And that is this error correcting code? Yes. So this mm-hmm. this would be an example of an error correcting okay. code, probably the most famous one. Interesting. Yeah, I think and this is t- um territory that's often covered when you have like snark tutorials these days. It's very much like, oh, here's a, a polynomial IOP and here's a polynomial commitment scheme. And everything revolves around polynomials. Right. So so But yeah, if you here look we're at sort every, of generalizing. Every, every, right. So everything like Starkware is is doing uh, to the best of my knowledge nowadays is based on this read Solomon error correcting code and building this mechanism around it so that you can prove statements when you are encoding your witness or your computation using this type of code. But there are a lot of other great codes around there and we have yet to understand how we can use them in this context, but we have some new ideas. So a lot of the linear time proving is coming from from a better understanding of that. So there's a lot of things that I would like to unpack and get to. So one thing you mentioned the um, the Benson's homework like Fry and Fry actually stands for uh, fast read Solomon as you were saying read Solomon codes interactive oracle proof of proximity. So this thing that I interactive oracle proof of proximity I'm curious to chat more about sort mm-hmm. of what its role is within the snark construction and how it interacts with the error correcting code. And then okay. the other thing is obviously uh, talking about some more recent error correcting codes and some more recent works that mm-hmm. use those. So, so here's, here's a basic template of how to build an IOP, an interactive Oracle proof. You take uh, your, think of it as the witness or the entire computation, you encode it under an error correcting code, and uh, you send that as your first Oracle. Okay, so you, you send over that entire thing. And now you want is, now you want a couple of mechanisms. One mechanism that you would like is to check that what, the, the message that was sent was indeed a correct code word. Okay, so that's one thing that you would like. And once you have that guarantee that it's a correct code word, 
then you want other mechanisms on top that allow you sort of to check the this code word represents a correct computation. Okay. Fry is basically a protocol solving the first problem. So you took you took your computation, you encoded it under uh, the read solve and encoding. Now you would like a protocol that lets you check that something is indeed a valid read solve and encoding. So that is exactly what Fry does. Okay, so proximity there is proximity to a code word. Okay, so I should correct the word exactly because it is approximately what Fry yeah. does. <laughs> so what Fry guarantees to you is that the message that was sent is close okay. to a valid code word. But in this context, close is sort of good enough. I wonder if you'd if you'd allow me a little bit of a step back to the definition of error correcting codes, mm -hmm. because you'd say it's encoded with mm. Reed Solomon, so, so that Reed is an example. Solomon encoding. But I, I I guess like I saw that more as like an action, like like some sort of tool. But when there's an entire paradigm that encodes it in that way. I don't, I don't actually understand where it's, where the error correction happens. Like, is right. it... so, so, so let me try to be a bit more precise. So okay. think of, you know, Alice, poor Alice has her message and she wants to transmit it. What she's looking for is a function. It's a function mapping from a set of possible messages. So we think of this as the message space into a set of possible code words. This is the code word space. Okay. We definitely want this function to be injective because given the code word, you want to be able to recover the message. But we want it to be beyond injective. We want it to have the property, it's a property called distance, that if you take any two code words in the code word space, so if you take any two messages and encode them, you want the resulting code words to be far apart from one another. Uh. And the reason for that is that, you know, think of Alice taking a message and encoding it and sending it. If the number of uh, bit flips, say, that happened is relatively small, and you have this guarantee that around the... so. Think we have this code word that Alice sent. The message that is received by Bob is going to be close to it, right? Because the number of flip of bit flips, let's say, is bounded. And then as long as there are no other code words floating around near to the code word that Bob received, then at least theoretically should be able to, to recover the code word and hence the message. So here distance is a measure of how many bits are different, right? Yes. This, this is yeah. called Hamming distance, actually. Shannon was looking at uh, a situation in which each bit is flipped with some probability, mm -hmm. whereas here we're just bounding the absolute number of bit flips, which is sort of more relevant to when using error correcting codes to build proof systems. Hmm. I'm sort of trying to go back to the initial definition, though, which which was like, if it were if this message were to be somewhat corrupted, it would still be recoverable. I don't really mm -hmm. know. I don't understand why the proximity matters for that. Okay, so. so Imagine that you, let's go by counter example. So suppose that you have an error correcting code in which you have two messages, which map to code words that differ only on one bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now suppose that one of these messages, Alice attempted to send one of these messages and uh, a code word is, is received by, uh, by Bob. But now Bob is uncertain, you know, did that bit flip happen or did it not? And depending on whether it happened or not, I see. then the, you know, he's confused about what message uh, Alice meant to send. So this would be not very easy to recover. So this yeah, would be so kind of like a hard. bad error correction, correcting yeah. code. <laughs> yeah, this, okay. this, this would be a terrible error correcting code. <laughs> okay, got um, it. So the property that we want really is that for, if you take any two messages and you look at their encoding, they're going to be far, the encodings will be far from one another. I see. So, so that is the basic definition of an error correcting code. Okay. I'll give you a bit of a visual example of how you can pick up on an error very quickly. So if you're using reed solomon codes, so polynomials, you could very well have that your message gets encoded into like a straight line. Like if you're drawing it in a graph, you'll have a straight line, right? Or some graph of a polynomial. Some nice, elegant polynomial. Exactly. <laughs> Things are nicely aligned. But then only one of the points is like slightly off from the pretty line. Uh. So in that case, you do know like, okay, that point is where the bit flip happened. This is the error. And it should have been on the pretty line. Ah. Uh because it's complicated enough like the it would be almost exactly. probabilistically impossible that you'd have sort of like a wrong polynomial that exactly would only have yeah missed if that you were to draw a smooth something. line that went through all those points it would be very high degree so it'd have a lot of bounces and this is why we're talking uh reed solomon codes or you use low degree polynomials right yeah. so you don't allow too many bounces i see it has to be a nice smooth line okay I hope that makes sense, Ron. I see you mm -hmm. nodding, so I'm... Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I like that explanation. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs>
I always, uh, and this is uh, maybe a tangent here, I always thought that Fry was similar or something to like Fast Fourier transformations. Is it? It's so it's inspired, th- th- but th- that is sort of how the protocol works. But it's okay. important for to understand what is the problem that this protocol is trying to solve. And the problem that it's trying to solve is, you know, I I was sent, the prover sent over a code word, which it allegedly encoded as a low degree polynomial. And mm-hmm. I want to check that that's indeed the case, or at least approximately the case. That That's a problem that it's trying to solve. The way that it does it is inspired by how FFT works. But the purpose of FFTs is something else. Yes. I see. Okay. The outcome. I kind of forget what what are the what is the purpose of a fast Fourier transformation again? So, I, I I learned it years ago in the context of like music technology. So like yeah. yeah. So I, I, and I I wouldn't say that it's uh it's unrelated, but it's it's not sort of th- there is a way to frame it so that it is similar. But anyway, what what is FFT? So, okay, so with polynomials, there are two nice ways to view them. One is via the sort of what's called the coefficient uh, basis or perspective. You know, to describe a polynomial, I'll just tell you what its coefficients are. Mm-hmm. So that, that is one way to view a polynomial. A different way to view the polynomial is you can think of it as kind of the graph that Nico described. So just the values that this polynomial uh, obtains on some sufficiently large set. Mm-hmm. Okay, so these are two different bases or different, two different views of how to, uh, to look at a polynomial. Depict them. Okay. And the FFT is a fast algorithm, a very fast algorithm that lets you move from one to the other. Oh, okay. Okay. And so what you're saying is Fry uses that technique of moving f- from two views? No, yep. it's, so it has to do with, uh, I mean, th- that is also true in, in a more, <laughs> sort of more, more involved way. But okay. uh, I'm saying that the way that Fry, so the, again, the goal in FFT is what I described to move between these bases. Mm-hmm. The way that FFT works is somehow to try to decompose this polynomial uh, into parts and work with the parts and so on. And Fry is following this also the same basic thing. It's trying to decompose the polynomial, uh, work with the parts and recurse. Okay. So they are both recursive. One is a recursive algorithm. Fry is a recursive protocol. Both work by decomposing a degree D polynomial into, let's say, two degree D over two polynomials mm-hmm. and sort of combining them or working with them. And as you do that, which direction are you going? Are you going from a number of points along a graph with a line through it? Or are you going to the coefficients? In, in Fry, so in, in Fry, you're just working. So you start off with, uh, so you're, you're looking at the evaluation perspective and you're going from a problem of checking that. You, so you're given the evaluation of something that is claimed to be a degree D polynomial. Mm-hmm. But remember, you're only allowed to look at very few points. Yeah. And Fry is giving you a reduction of how to reduce that into checking a similar statement about a degree D over two polynomial. I'm sorry. I think I was still talking about the FFTs. Mm. Mm-hmm. I was actually wondering which direction are you going with FFTs? Do you go both directions? Both. So the there's reason, FFT and okay. there's an inverse FFT. The reason I was asking is I thought, I thought what you were describing was one direction and that Fry was using the techniques of one direction. Uh, the directions are very related. So there's FFT, which is going from the... I guess, coefficient perspective into the evaluation perspective mm-hmm. or, or basis is the proper mathematical term. Okay. I um, mean, there's an inverse FFT that does the, the, the reverse. And is there one that Fry is more similar to? I think the forward one. Yeah, I guess. So usually people also think of the forward one. It's like, uh, that, that, that's FFT and it does look very similar to that. Say, say that one again. What is the forward one? Yeah. So it's going from coefficient, from the coefficient perspective to the evaluation perspective. I see. So, so FFT, by the way, is also kind of the reason why it's a, it's a big part of why people love the Reed Solomon code, because it allows for a very fast um, encoding of messages. So if you view your message as a bunch of uh, coefficients mm-hmm. and you want to encode them and get the polynomial, voila, that's exactly what FFT does. And it does it very, very well. Interesting. So why would we want to work with other codes than the Reed Solomon code? If it's so efficient, it's so great. <laughs> okay, so so t- two reasons. Um, one is that it's great, but it is not the greatest, um, at least asymptotically speaking. So the running time of doing an FFT, if say you have um, n coefficients or you're working of computation of size n, then the time that it takes to do it is something like uh, order of n log n. Whereas we know uh, other codes for which the encoding is O of n. So 
you know, n log n is pretty awesome, but O of n is even more awesome. So why not? So is this where the line of work on linear prover sort of yes. starts coming? Yes. In? Okay. Another related thing, which is sort of more directly related to uh, some work of mine, is that Reed Solomon works over a very large field. So you need your field to be large enough sort of for your graph that you were drawing to make sense. You need the number of points that you can talk about to be um, at least the message length. Mm -hmm. What this means is that when using Reed Solomon based techniques, you need the field to be at least the circuit size. The field size needs to be at least the, the circuit size. And, and, and this forces, so that is what like a lot of people are doing. So that, that's what Starkware is doing. But I feel like, so it's true that Reed Solomon has this property, but other codes don't. So you have other efficient codes that work over small fields. Mm -hmm. Can we use them and maybe try to support computations, sort of non-arithmetic computations, Boolean computations much more efficiently? I see. And then is there a trade-off between, I guess, the speed at which you can encode with your um, error correcting code and how you do your IOP of proximity? Um, a a trade-off in terms of, of efficiency? I mean, that if you're using yeah, more efficiency, efficient. I guess. Okay, so may maybe this is a good time to point out that, so Re Reed Solomon has a lot of amazing properties. One of them is this uh, very fast encoding, not, not the best, but, but very good. The other one, which is really fundamental to all of the IOP constructions, is what's known as the multiplicative property. Okay, so so actually, may, maybe before that, let me uh, talk about the additive property, which is a more basic one. So, right, if you take two degree d polynomials and you add them up, the result is going to be a degree d polynomial. And that is very useful for sort of, we use this property when trying to handle, think of a circuit that has addition gates. Mm -hmm. um, that, that is something that's very useful. The other very nice property that Reed Solomon uh, co as code has is that if you take any two polynomials and you multiply them point-wise, so each point of the polynomial is multiplied, the effect is like you are basically multiplying the entire polynomials, and it means that the, the degree doubles. Okay, so if you take two degree d polynomials, you get a degree 2d mm -hmm. polynomial. And it means that if you take, so in other words, if you take two uh, code words and you do this pointwise product between them, the result is going to be a not too bad code word in itself. Does that make sense? So, so it's not, it doesn't live in the same code because the degree has doubled, yeah. but as long as you, you make your field large enough, um, it is going to have error correction properties. And this multiplicative property is really, really key to all of the, um, IOP constructions. Uh, except some uh, very recent ones. And it is very hard to come by. So we have very few codes that have this magical property. I see. Is it a requirement? No, we, I'm sure we can work without it, right? So I view um, it used to be a requirement in the sense that the only way that we knew how to do arithmetization involved multiplication codes. Mm -hmm. So the reason that you hear about univariate polynomials and multivariate polynomials uh, throughout all of these works to a large extent, um, to a very large extent, is due to this multiplicative property. And until, you know, I, I would say that, roughly speaking, until a couple of years ago, we didn't know any other way. So when I was talking about sort of barriers that we would need in order to get better efficiency, I viewed that as, as, a, big, as, as a big barrier that we had to overcome, right? So we have, we, we want this multipl multiplicative property. Uh, we have Reed Solomon that has it, but Reed Solomon, you know, it has its features, but it also has its disadvantages, which we would like to avoid. Yeah. Hmm. As we as we talk about all of this, and I, I think Nico, you did say this very briefly, you know, a few beats ago, but you know, we always learn about the polynomial commitment schemes, and Fry falls under that category. Does that mean that error correcting codes, like, are all of those polynomial commitment schemes that we've learned? error correcting code schemes like is that what those are or is it sort of like some of the polynomial commitment schemes that we are using use the technique of error correcting codes um so, so maybe it's worth clearing things up a little because I, I think there's some some confusion because so so we have this uh we have an let's say we have an iop and in the iop we we said that we want to send code words mm -hmm. right 
So on side, kind of the IOP side, that's what happens. You, you send over code words, whether it be polynomial, whether it be something else. Later on, what we'd be interested in doing is compiling this into a succinct argument. You don't want to actually send this huge code word. You want to send something short that represents it. Okay. That is exactly what sort of polynomial commitments do with respect to the Reed Solomon code, or if you're talking about unified polynomials or um, sort of Reed Muller, what's known as a Reed Muller code, if you're talking about uh, multivariate low degree polynomials. In general, you could think of, you know, given a particular error correcting code C, do you have uh, the analog of a polynomial commitment with respect to this specific code C? Does that make sense? Sort of. So I think what you're saying is like the error correcting code part is sort of bridging between these two sections of a snark. Uh, so, 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 so the error correcting code sort of lives in the IOP land. Okay. And the polynomial commitment is what is allowing you to translate that from the IOP land into a snark land. Okay. And but then why why is Fry considered right. a polynomial commitment scheme? Right. So 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 Fry, the way it is phrased and the way that uh, you know, if you look at the paper, the way it's phrased is as a component inside an IOP. However, if you take Fry and you compile it using Merkle trees, basically what you will get is a polynomial commitment. Okay. Okay, so so you can kind of uh. sort of Fry's is is part of this bridging between um, let's see, between a polynomial IOP and the SNARG, and then you can sort of push Fry to either side. If you push it towards the SNARG side, you view it from the lens of polynomial commitment. If you push it to the polynomial IOP, you can transform the polynomial IOP into the honest-to-God IOP. Okay. I think I sort of get it. I, I, It seems a little in the weeds. Actually, I'd like to share with my mental model there. So we were saying earlier, like, Okay, Reed Solomon codes are evaluations of polynomials. And you as a verifier, you don't want to read the whole thing. You just want to check a few values. So when I give you like a short commitment to something, you want to know was it a commitment to a Reed Solomon code or not? If I translate that into polynomial land, I could reset it as was this a commitment to a polynomial? Uh huh. So this is where like Fry acts as a polynomial commitment scheme because it makes sure that some commitment, the values behind that commitment are actually the evaluations of a polynomial or close enough. Does that make sense? Kind of. Kind of, okay. It, I mean, it sort of <laughs> follows what I was trying to say there, which is, it yeah. sounds like if Fry, Fry out of context of a Stark, it's just, it's not necessarily doing all that its name pertained, like its acronym. So you're translating the name, right? You're replacing Reed Solomon by polynomial. You're, yeah. So is it so, yeah, so no, I mean, exactly. the, the, the I in Fry stands for an IOP or, or more accurately an IOP of proximity. Um, you can, the point is you can take any IOP, in particular this one, and compile it using Merkle trees, and you get an argument, a succinct argument. So if you did that directly to Fry rather than the entire protocol, what you end up getting is a polynomial commitment. I still don't get, I still don't understand if the Reed Solomon part of it is still in it. Yes. Is that always there? It's always there. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's the, the, the Reed Solomon, polynomial. whenever someone tells you Reed Solomon, just Delete replaced by the word polynomial. In that context, though. In, in any context. So in all contexts. Oh, okay, okay. Read is e just equal to univariate polynomial. I think I almost get it. I probably at some point need to see this on a, a whiteboard, but thanks so much for explaining it. Of course. I wanted to, I think, circle back to something we were talking about just now. So we're still in Reed Solomon land. What, what comes after? What kind of codes have you been using in your work on the near time provers? Okay, so... Going back to what I was saying before, we, we seem to be having this barrier where we need this multiplicative uh, property on the one hand, but codes that have it are a tiny bit slow. We would like to use faster codes that are available. And By slow, we mean the encoding, right? The encoding. So FFT is awesome, but uh, we have this annoying log n factor that we would like to get rid of. And we know that in principle, we have codes that are faster. So I was working with uh, a coding theorist, Noga Ronsvi, um, also also in Haifa, like me. And we had this idea, which we call code switching, which is saying the following. So instead of encoding the computation using uh, the slow code, we'll encode it using the, the fast code. Great, so far. The problem that we run into is that we, were, we, we wanted to use this multiplicative property, which we don't have anymore. So what we proposed is to pretend as though we did have, as though the message that we had sent was indeed the polynomial, the Reed-Solomon encoding. Mm -hmm. You send a super fast encoding of whatever you want of the computation, let's say. 
the prover and verifier pretend as though what had been sent was actually um, you know, a polynomial, mm-hmm. a polynomial encoding, we run the protocol as if it were that. At the end of the day, now the verifier wants to access, let's say, a point in this polynomial. And our observation was that you can now run a sub protocol proving that oh, okay. if you took the, the message that is encoded within the super efficient code, if you had encoded it as a polynomial and looked at that point, you would have seen a particular value. And we show that you can do this sort of using some check-based uh, techniques. Wow, okay. And does this come at a big cost for the verifier or in proof size? Um, not, not, not so much. So wow. it, it adds more, more interaction because you need to run a sub-protocol, but that you sort of can fiat them your way later on. Mm-hmm. And this is, uh, so this basic idea, so, so we had this paper uh, with Noga in which we did this in the context we had, like we were constructing IOPs that are extremely short. So the amount of communication in the IOP is just barely, barely more than just sending over the witness, mm-hmm. which is what you would do if you had like no locality constraints. So it's say 1.1 times the length of the witness. And the, the idea there was to use a very efficient uh, encoding in terms of like number of bits for the first message, and then later on switch to, to the polynomials. But, but later on, this basic idea was used by, uh, in a paper by John Boodle, Ali Kiesa, and, and Jens Groth. And they were saying, you know, at least the way I view what they were saying is send, construct the first encoding using a very, very fast code, one of these like linear time encodable codes, pretend that you had sent the polynomial, run the protocol, and then verify. And then, uh, this work of, of Justin Taylor and others breakdown builds on that. And Orion, a more recent one, builds on that. So in all these papers, the basic thing that you want to say, what you want to have is a very fast linear time encodable code with this property that you can sort of, after the fact, at the end, check properties related to, you know, if I had taken this message and encoded it as a polynomial, would I have seen something? It turns out that that property is relatively easy to get. You can use it using, basically, you can transform any efficient code into a code that supports that with relatively small overhead. This is an operation called tensoring. And this is what uh, all, all of these linear time uh, poor uh, works do. Tensoring. So, so they start off with an efficient linear time encodable code. And then they do, on top of that, they do tensoring. Mm-hmm. And I think there's now uh, a lot of room to try to optimize the basic linear time encodable code that you're using. Is, is tensoring a known phenomenon? T- 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 tensoring is, uh, it's a known phenomenon. It's, it's an amazing thing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in a sense, whenever we say sum check, what we actually mean is tensoring. Um, okay. it, it sounds complicated, but it's actually really simple. So tensoring is a way to take a code and build from it a new code that has some amazingly nice properties. Okay. And the way that the okay. construction works is really simple. So suppose that you already have a, a great code that you love. I'll tell you how to build a new code from it. It's called the tensor, uh, the square tensor of it or whatever. So, right, so we already have a code. We're trying to build a new and better code. The way that this new and better code works is you're going to look at your messages as matrices. Think, for example, of uh, it's simplest if you think of a square matrix. Mm-hmm. And now you're going to go to each one of your rows and encode, it, encode the row using the code that we have. Right, so we start off with some number of rows. We got some extra columns, kind of, because we encoded these rows. And now you go to each one of both original columns and these new columns. And you encode them again using this code. Mm-hmm. I, I wanted to give like an example of why, like uh, a, a sort of a concrete example. So if, if you take the Reed Solomon code and you tensor it, and if you tensor it more than, so if you tensor it once, what you end up seeing is a bivariate polynomial. If you tensor it a lot of times, what you end up seeing is a low degree multivariate polynomial. And in fact, if you take uh, Nico's example from before of the Reed Solomon code with the line, that's a, a very, that's a encoding for encoding sort of, I want to say either one or two bit messages. Um, if you take that very basic code and you tensor it enough times, what you end up get, getting is sort of multilinear polynomials. Mm-hmm. And this tensor operation is what really underlies the sum check protocol. Did that make sense? It does. Yeah. yeah. I'm just taking a, a second to absorb it because yeah, it is what we're doing when we're putting all our points into like the Boolean hypercube, but then we're still like defining our polynomial in a way bigger thing. Yeah. I, I never thought of it this way, yeah. So 
in that sense, when you do tensoring, you have some kind of blow up yes. of the original code? Okay. Yes. So it, it kind of, uh, in terms of the parameters of the code, um, so you get a lot of magical properties from this. So you get the sum check protocol, you get um, something called local testing, which is an analog of Fry in this uh, situation. Mm -hmm. The cost comes in, in two ways. First of all, in terms of the amount of redundancy that you've inserted. So previously said you were encoding K bits into N bits. Now you're encoding K squared bits into N squared bits. And if you look at it as a ratio, the ratio is kind of squared, mm -hmm. right? So if you look at K over N, now it's K squared over N squared. If you were say, uh, you had this, this ratio was a half, now it's a quarter. So you've inserted sort of more redundancy, your code is longer and you're a little bit sadder. So that, that's one place where you pay a little bit. The other place that you pay is in terms of this notion of distance that I was talking about. So how far apart different code words are from one another. So it turns out it's not a hard exercise to show that in terms of like the relative number of bits that are different between these messages is going to also square. So if you started off with the code with, usually we use delta to uh, indicate this parameter. So it's the like the percent of bits that uh, you have to flip in order to go from one code word to another, the minimal number of, of such uh, bit flips. And that percent is going to square. Which is a good thing, right? Uh, no, it's a bad thing. Oh, bad thing. Yeah, so you're, you're paying both. This squaring thing happens both in terms of the, the redundancy. So you're paying there and you're paying in terms of the distance. But you're gaining a lot of uh, amazing properties. So if I then look at the IOP as a whole that we're starting to build here, is that going to translate into like some soundness error? Yes. Essentially. So, okay. Yes. So, um, the the distance is closely related to to the soundness error, and because we are taking uh, some limited hit in terms of the distance, this will you know will pay in terms of soundness error, or rather we will need to compensate for that by doing some sort of repetition or amplification to to bypass that. Let's talk about some of your recent work. Because I feel like we've spent a lot of time talking about the error correcting codes, which is useful. But I feel like, yeah, from what we, when doing a little bit of research on you, Ron, there, it sounded like there was quite a body of work and quite a few threads that you were excited about. So, yeah, why don't you tell us about some of the other work that you're looking at? Sure. So one body of work that I've done a lot, a lot of work on is related to the Fiat Shamir transform. So maybe it's worth to quickly remind the, the audience what that is. So it's basically this magical method of taking any interactive protocol. It needs to satisfy one thing that I will say in a second and take this interactive protocol and make it non-interactive. So instead of a ping pong back and forth between verifier and prover, boom, it's a single message that prover sends, uh, can put on the blockchain or God knows where, and that's it. So, so it's, it's fantastic. The only like uh, star that I had to add there is that the original protocol has to be what's called public coin, which means that throughout the protocol, all the verifier does is just toss random coins and tell the results to the prover. No like fancy messages that the verifier needs to send. And the basic idea of how to do this is that rather than the verifier actually sending out these coins, the prover is going to compute them by herself by taking some very complicated hash function and applying it to basically everything that the prover saw so far throughout the, the execution. And the hope is that because, so if you sort of follow this logic, you apply, you, you apply the hash function to everything that happened in the, in the execution, and only then you get the result, then you can not sort of tailor your previous messages for this result. Because if you were to try to modify previous messages, then the hash value would also change. Okay, so so that is the Fiat Chemio transform. Uh, we've known of uh, we've known it since uh, this work of, of uh, Amos Fiat and Andy Shamir from '86. And in terms of security, there's a lot to be said there. So first of all, we know that this thing is secure in the in the random oracle model. So that that has been has been shown, and that is why it is incredibly uh, popular in practice. So people are using it uh, all over whether it be in, in zero-knowledge proofs or in, in signatures that we're all using. So it's incredibly popular. Um, in theory land, we are somewhat unhappy with this random oracle situation. We would like to base things on, you know, standard model. Can we do it based on discrete log or factoring or something concrete? Why do you dislike the random oracle model? Okay, so one of the reasons is that there exist examples of protocols 
that are interactive public coin protocols, which are, you know, sound, secure, they're great. But if you apply Fiat Shamir to them, no matter what hash function you use, the resulting the result is going to be insecure. Okay. Okay. So there are specific protocols where if you apply Fiat Shamir, no matter in what way, mm-hmm. the end result is going to be insecure. Are these protocols kind of built for that property? Like, are they slightly pathological in the way they're made? So yes and no. Um, so the first such uh, protocol is, uh, so this started with the work of uh, Ram Canetti, Elu Goldreich, and Shia Levy, and Boss Brock had a related work, which does a more sort of more directly uh, does this. And if you look at those protocols, they are extremely contrived. You, you think, you know, these were exactly built in order to be insecure when you apply Fiat Shamir. But nevertheless, it shows you, you know, the reason why we think Fiat Shamir is secure is because it just looks like it should always be secure and not because of any special properties of the protocols that we're using. That's what I think, you know, common sense tells us. These counterexamples are saying that the common sense does not suffice. If this thing really is secure, Mm. it has to do with some specific properties of the underlying protocols. So one related thing that I wanted to mention is that uh, I had this uh, work with with, with other co-authors a couple of years ago, where we actually gave an example of, so like going back to this template of how we build Snarks, we take something like an IOP, we compile it with Merkle trees, and we get a we get a snark. So we gave an example of an IOP for which you follow this paradigm of compiling it with the Merkle tree. You apply Fiat Shamir, it's going to become insecure. So it's a secure IOP, but if you go through all of this machinery, the end result and non-interactive Fiat Shamir thing is insecure. In other words, if uh, when applying Fiat Shamir, you know. You, you take the IOP as a black box, which you don't want to uh, look into and understand. We have counterexamples for when Fiat Shamir, when doing this, is insecure. When you say sort of secure and insecure, is are these binaries? Like, is it like... It's extremely insecure. Like, to be insecure, it's broken, unusable? Yes, yes there is a okay, false okay. statement <laughs> for which you can efficiently okay, okay. construct a proof that is going to be verified with probability one. So strongest possible attack you can imagine. Very, very insecure. Got it. Okay. Very, okay, okay. very, the most insecure I can, I can imagine. It's broken. Uh, it breaks yes. it. Absolutely broken. Yeah. Not, not a little bit, all the way. Okay. Um, not a little bit. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, just, yeah. I just wanted to be sure. Yeah. Okay, I see, I see. So one thing like I, I will, I will give some hope and then take it away. So one reason for hope is even this, like, <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> it, um, this IOP that we have constructed is itself, it looks very weird. There's a component there. That if you look at other IOPs, uh, they don't have it, and it's 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 baked in there as a trapdoor to to kind of to ruin it. Mm-hmm. And you'd say, okay, no, good. We usually don't have these in in IOPs. Mm-hmm. The reason why I'm going to take the hope away, sorry about that, is that this component looks to me it looks very reminiscent of uh, snar composition, of recursive composition. Mm. So there is something about some form of diagonalization of running a program on itself as input which is going on there, which, you know, if you just look at an IOP, you don't see that. But when you're starting to do recursive composition, you do see Ooh. this kind of thing, which I find worrying. Um, I've tried to think of attacks. I haven't come up with any so far, but it certainly hmm. would not, uh, I would not be shocked if there was an attack based on this. And when you say you called it sort of recursive constructions of snarks, but are you also talking about like accumulation and yeah. folding scheme type stuff? Like, uh, no, I'm talking about recursive composition. So you have a snark okay. um, or uh, IVC or whatever. Uh, you have a, a, a snark and then you're starting to prove statements about the verification of the snark itself. Okay, after mm-hmm. the snark is finished. Yes. Not You're not talking about this sort of like internal accumulation or internal um, yeah, recursion. Yeah, there, there everything is a little bit like too concrete, I think. Too, too concrete in the sense that I don't, it's hard for me to see how to frame things in, to view them similarly. Okay, okay. Is it about this issue of, so we have our snarks in the random oracle model, and then when we want to do a snark of a snark, we actually need the circuit of our snark verifier. So our random oracle no longer is a random oracle, it's an actual circuit. Yes. Is that kind of the problem that's linked to it? Yes, and this is all based on, uh, it's hypothetical, just like it feels to me okay. similar to uh, this uh, contrived, Examples that we have, ah. uh, I would have loved to to show an attack. I mean, maybe others would have been sad, but I would have been happy. <laughs> um, 
Uh, I have yet to, to do that so far. So that is, you know, it's all hypothetical. I mean, if we realize that it's insecure, I think everyone's better off if you find the attack. Right, right. <laughs> what was the, you sort of started to talk about, like, do you have an alternative? You said you don't want the random Oracle model. Right. I think you mentioned what you would prefer to have. Yeah, so there's been a huge body of work on trying to make Fiat Shamir secure when we have a hash function, right? What if we use the, the hash function based on one of our favorite hash functions like Peterson or uh, something based on lattices or something like that? Can we use a concrete hash function in order to do Fiat Shamir and just prove that it works? And even in, in theory land where we are a lot more flexible in terms of we don't have things, things to be concretely efficient, uh, we didn't know how to do anything positively. We had counterexamples. We had these like contrived counterexamples, mm. and we didn't know how to do anything positively until 2016, I think. Okay. And then we had this paper showing for the first time uh, a concrete hash function based on a very strong but still concrete uh, cryptographic assumption. However, this and all of the follow-ups that I'll mention in a second, they work only for particular nice protocols. So they work as long as the interactive protocol that you start off with is a proof rather than an argument. So it has security even against an unbounded proof. Mm. So for those type of protocols, since that work, and we've had uh, amazing follow-ups uh, since, we basically, at least in theory land, we now know how to instantiate Fiat Shamir securely. But only for that limited set of protocols. Do you have any examples of those? What were the yes. nice ones? The nice one would be GKR. So GKR is an interactive protocol for all bounded depth computations, mm. and it's an interactive proof with statistical soundness. And so we know how to do Fiat Shamir to GKR, for example. Okay. We even know how to go how to go beyond that. Um, but it, it is so it's a very rich class, but still limited. And also in terms of efficiency, the hash functions for which we know how to do this are essentially based. You could say that they're based on FHE. So they're not going to be concretely efficient. What was the very strong cryptographic assumption you're referring to? Um, so the that was in the earlier work. It's still it's been improved since. Um, in the early work, we needed to assume that some sort of encryption scheme was optimally hard, meaning that there is basically no attack better than brute force mm -hmm. in some quantitative way, and even stronger than that. Um, but it was a basic feasibility result to show that in principle, something that we did not know in, at all could be done based on some assumption. Nowadays, we can base it on uh, an assumption called learning with errors, which is sort of the cornerstone of all lattice-based cryptography and a very widely uh, studied assumption. So what other open problems or topics, themes, are you interested in these days or working on? Um, so actually, I'll go back to something we were talking about before with efficient provers, because there's a question that that's, I'm, I'm really interested in. And I think it's also very relevant to practice. Um, so these works that I mentioned before, Breakdown, Orion, um, BC, BCG work from before that, which achieved linear time provers, they're all considering um, arithmetic circuits over large fields. And they, over this, in this setting, they indeed achieve a linear time prover. The thing I was curious as, you know, an innocent theoretician is what can we say about Boolean circuits, right? So we have hash functions, SHA or whatnot, uh, that are natively described as Boolean circuits. One direction that I think that the industry and uh, people are taking is, you know, these are not nice functions because they're not fr friendly to order synthesization. Let's invent new hash functions. And I'm saying, you know, let's try to work with these. What can we do in terms of proving correctness of Boolean circuits? And there the, like, the, the ideas underlying the linear time provers uh, sort of uh, break down. I had a couple of works on this. And the first work, which is also with Noga, we managed to construct, even in this harder setting of Boolean circuits, a uh, strictly linear time prover. But the downside was that the soundness error was a constant rather than being some you know, negligible function, which is what we prefer. So that, that was uh, unfortunate. I mean, we were very, very happy to have the linear time prover in the setting, but the soundness error was uh, large. I had a, a follow-up with uh, Justin Holmgren in which we could show that you can get two to the mind. So if you take this basic protocol with Noga and you repeat it lambda times, you're going to get two to the minus lambda soundness error, which is good. But the running time now becomes, you know, size of circuit times lambda. I have a uh, work with Justin Holmgren in which we managed to reduce this to something like n times log lambda. 
Okay, so that is sort of framed in the right way. It's an exponential improvement um, in terms of the depend. So, right, instead of, take, if you think of concretely, instead of multiplying n by 128, you're multiplying n by log of 128. So th that is a big improvement. But the basic theoretical question for me is, can you construct IOPs and succinct arguments where the prover is strictly linear time and the soundness error is negligible? That is something that we do not know how to do. And I think that has the potential to save another uh, order of magnitude uh, in terms of improvement, potentially also for practical uh, linear time proving. Mm -hmm. So was this for Boolean circuits specifically or for all circuits? So, so it, it, it basically works for, it kind of takes away the restriction on the field. So it can work for any field that you like. Okay, cool. The hardest case being when the field is just 0, 1, F2. That, that's the hardest case, which the most challenging case, but it works for any field that you like. I, I think you've mentioned a few times someone named Noga. Can you maybe introduce who that person is? Yes, it's uh, Noga Ronsvi, who is a fantastic coding theorist at the University of Haifa. Um, and I mean, we cooperated on these things because there's this very intimate connection between error correcting codes and PCPs and IOPs. And I think this joint perspective of coding from her side, proof systems uh, from me, is what sort of enabled uh, these developments. And I think that nowadays, if you look at like optimizing the proof runtime and constructing better error correcting codes, I think a coding theory perspective is really, really important uh, there. Well, cool. Well, thank you, Ron, for walking us through complexity theory, information theory, error correcting codes, all the way to Fiat Shamir transformation security. Um, yeah, thank you so much for sharing with us all of this information and, and all of this insight. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks. Yeah, this was a pleasure. Likewise. And I want to say a big thank you to the ZK Podcast team, Henrik, Rachel, and Tanya. And to our listeners, thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.